About a year ago, I transferred to Wellston Private High School. I had worked very hard to get into this school. Many sleepless nights, countless hours of studying. With such difficult entrance exams, I expected academics to be the main focus at Wellston. I expected it to be different. But I was wrong. What is going on, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, the one and only Almighty Anon, bringing you another episode of Unordinary Analysis. I'm actually a little bit butthurt myself because uh, July 27th was when episode 309 was supposed, or chapter 309 was supposed to come out, and then that day comes and I get super excited and I open up Webtoon and there's no new chapter and I'm like, what the fuck? And I scroll to the story notes and she said that she had to delay it for a week, which I mean, cool. Do your thing. I get it. I'm just butthurt because I was hyped. That's all. So, given that I'm not on such a time crunch for this episode, um, you know, I started working on it ahead of time. I had more time to work on it. Today, we're going to be reviewing and reacting to chapters 6 through 13 of Unordinary. If you just happen to stumble upon this video, I highly suggest going and watching episode 1, which covers the prologue through chapter 5. Just as a brief recap for y'all, Last episode, we met an array of titular characters, including Remy, Arlo, this ginger guy, this bully, Doc, Serafina, and our absolute Chad, John. John took a prolonged potty break, got his arm broken, and Sarah came through to kick it with him. Alright, enough small talk, let's just hop into chapter 6. We open with the resolution to Doc's angry stomp out scene from last chapter. That ginger guy... He was fighting this guy. Doc must just put the fear of God into some of these students because these guys both have the exact same thought. While Doc is ripping these guys to shreds, we see Serafina's leftovers crawl into the infirmary. Quickly realizing what's happened, Doc contemplates his life choices. Hop over to Woba Boba, where the goat squad is straight sipping like nothing has happened. Sarah laughs that John threw the bully out the window, which the man is not happy about. And then she says, it's got to be a little exciting. This is one of the first semi-serious moments in the story, as John explains how he wants peace in his life. Their discussion escalates, and Sarah ends up giving John the cold shoulder. Shorty, be nice to my boy, would you? In the background of this awkward silence, a news reporter announces that Vigilante Ecstatic has died with a rather gruesome image and a ticker reel stating, Ember Gang Strikes Again. After that, John and Sarah have another small exchange, but otherwise, the chapter just ends. This is the first ending, in my opinion, that really pulls the reader to want to continue, to want to find out more about the story, who's Ember, who's ecstatic, um, let's learn more about John, why does he want peace so bad, other than just you know him being defenseless, etc., etc., etc. Going into chapter 7, it gives us an opportunity to turn back the clock and see John's arrival to Wellston. You can see hopefulness and ambition in John's face here, and he even comments on that as he narrates over the flashback. Everything seems fine, and as he prepares to go to his next class, he's approached by a girl who introduces herself to be Elaine. Elaine's greeting goes from kind to, well, this. Like a lioness hunting for details about the newcomer. She's just asked what everybody's been idly wondering. When John reveals himself to be powerless, it doesn't bode well. Elaine quickly asserts her dominance, visibly unhappy with this development. Then we come back to present day, John answering a call from Serafina, and the chapter ends! I would say that that's this story's first fully serious chapter, and it's a fucking great one at that. Just a reminder that these are brief recaps, so if you aren't reading the manga for yourself, you're gonna miss a lot. Anyway, moving on to chapter 8, we open on Sarah the Drip Queen and the aforementioned phone call. As John makes excuses to not leave the house, because me too, John, his doorbell rings. Unkempt and looking untouchable, John forces his door and his wall into a relationship by slamming them together. I'm also impressed by how quickly he got dressed, given that this man's was in sleep clothes just a minute ago. Anyway, Sarah notices the spotless apartment, thus derailing John's excuse of needing to clean all day. One set of training gloves sits on the floor, and with impeccable speed... Sarah finishes a whole day of cleaning in seconds. Much to John's dismay, they go to Covero Mall, stopping at Andy's Boutique. I don't know what it is about the name Andy, but I'll just trust that place. Gives me the heebie-jeebies. 
Anyway. I say anyway a lot, don't I? John secures his position as King of Drip and gets distracted on their way out by the opportunity to win what'll probably be a shitty prize. The chapter ends while John and Sarah are in line for the gauge guy, because that's what he's doing. The opportunity was a power gauge table thing. Watching as this chick went full Karen because she only got a four. The first panel of chapter nine introduces a feature I absolutely adore, and it's these. Power scales. How fucking cool is that? These first two cover our bully from before, who we learn is named Gavin, then the Karen chick whose name is Levani. Anyway, moving into the actual plot now, John the King of Chad speaks up like he's the reveal character in a Darman video, and Levani Karen is not happy about it. Continuing to be the goat, John baits Levani to end up alerting security, but then the security guard ends up bitching out the gauge guy. Did... did Karen just win? Disappointed but grateful, Gage Guy asks if John and Sarah want to have their abilities scaled. Like the pimp she is, Sarah gets an 8, which is really high considering that the quote-unquote high tier starts at 5. She wins a super cute bear and the chapter pretty much ends there. I do have two little inquiries though. After starting to check Sarah's ability, this dude smirks. It's not a shocked expression like you'd expect for him reading a, like an 8 scale. It's just a weird smirk. Then the guy goes to ga Gage John... And instead of politely declining, John straight up fucking shinobi dodges that shit. Weird things happening in this chapter, y'all. When chapter 10 opens, it's already nightfall. The bus stop by the mall was crowded, so our favorite king and queen head to another one across the park. John detects a noise behind them, but the noise is disregarded as they begin talking about Sarah's bear. Sarah asks if John has any ideas for the bear's name, and like a stud, he pitches the perfect name. John's still suspicious that they're being followed, enough so that he drags Sarah into high gear. They get out of the park and round a corner before John launches the perfect test, the shirt toss. Without wasting a breath, Sarah team rockets the, that invisible bitch. Naturally, the chapter then ends on a cliffhanger. Chapter 11 skips ahead to being back at John's apartment. Sarah wastes no time asking the question we all had on our minds. How did John know they were being followed? We learn from the guy at the mall that Sarah's power is scaled at an 8, and she was none the wiser. John, without convincing anybody, creates an excuse. John convinces Sarah that it's not safe for her to return to the dorms, and she grabs some seat. She spots, sitting in broad daylight on the coffee table, a book titled Unordinary by W.H. Doe. Sarah pokes a sleeping bear, and John drops the bomb that his dad is the author. So this is the book that they talked about in the prologue. Heard. Heard. Sarah says she always wanted to read it and provide some subtle but crucial exposition. John takes a stand on his worldview, and the chapter ends with John letting Sarah borrow the book. Chapter 12 decides to be the pick-me chapter, insisting it's totally different from the rest by opening with a mysterious group tracking people in the city. We had nothing of a real plot for 10 chapters, and then all of a sudden the story just decided to hit puberty and decided to pop off. All right, I mean, I'm not mad at it. Let's just, let, let, let's just check on Sarah and John. So they start off this chapter straight up conked out, but this motherfucker John ain't counting sheep. He's having a whole ass nightmare flashback sequence. After he realizes he ain't finna get any sleep, he washes his face and reminds himself that the nightmare was just a dream. Sarah and Bear John still Scooby snacked up on the couch, John dips out. He hits up the corner store, but he can't even snack his problems away as his nightmare still bothers him. Sarah wakes up just as John gets back home and they sit down for a quiet breakfast. Shorty tries extending the olive branch, but John snaps it. In response, Sarah dips out. Sarah gets home to a pissed but concerned roommate and the chapter ends. This one kind of threw me for a loop, y'all. I'm not even gonna lie. Chapter 13 picks up where we left off, with Elaine not knowing how to stop nagging Sarah. With a flex the size of the moon, Sarah uses her ability to freeze Elaine, and it's clear the amount of fear in Elaine's eyes. After ripping Shorty a new one, Sarah calmly and collectively dips out of the conversation. John sends a classic apology text before reminding Sarah to be careful with his legally banned book. She quickly hides it as there's a knock at the bedroom door. I assumed that this was Elaine coming to apologize or some shit, but it turns out to be Arlo. Sarah goes to close the door, but Arlo needs her help with something called Turf Wars. A little exposition until suddenly, Arlo just drops a fucking lore bomb on us, calling Serafina Wellston's true queen. After a bit of exchange, Arlo assures her that she won't even have to fight. So, 
that that just pretty much told us that there are at least three important positions in the student hierarchy jack queen and what i'm assuming is the king position flash forward six hours to see arlo sarah elaine and the ginger kid from earlier riding the train just like that the chapter ends. okay six through thirteen this was a lot more interesting i would say of a segment in comparison to the prologue through chapter five granted the first like 10 or so chapters were mostly just there as like setting up the world but i can't imagine i, I would have to go back and look at the posting dates to see how long people had to wait because i i don't know if it were me personally i would have struggled to get into the story if i waited two weeks between chapters or whatever um in in that beginning sequence but I'm really glad that I came into the story when I did, when there was already like a hundred or so chapters out, because at that point it had enough plot developed that it really stuck with me. It's stuck in my brain, and I I love it. It's a phenomenal story. It carries through. I am posing some ignorance in these chapters, just pretending not to know some stuff, asking some questions. This is so that I can help you guys stir your brains into thinking about you know creating your own theories if you're not reading it. Or, um, you know, reminding people of details, I guess, if you have read it. Because even, you know, I, I just recently read 308 chapters of the story and I'm being reminded of things from early on. Uh, like the death of Ecstatic, I didn't realize that was that early on in the story because by the time it's addressed again later on, it feels like it's been ages and it was introduced later in and everything. So, yeah, I mean... I, Overall, the story is great. The author, she honestly, she doesn't pull an Akira Toriyama. She doesn't seem to forget anything. It feels like all bases are covered. Maybe, maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe I'll come across some plot holes doing this series with you guys. But I've had a couple of my friends tell me that they were really interested in it. They might not read it because they're not big into reading. And honestly, neither am I. Um, but they are keeping up with this series. So I I'm glad that I can at least provide for some people. The first episode did amazing it got 80 views um it did immediately get outshined by my spider-man 2 analysis video that got 140 something views but still the fact that my first ever analysis video on the channel being over this nerdy manga that i read online and for it to be doing that well it's heartwarming so i'm really glad you guys are enjoying you know tell your friends tell whoever if you got little siblings or older siblings who like this kind of stuff tell them about it i i will gladly give out this information to anybody and everybody who has any interest um Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for tuning in this video. Be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit that little notification bell so you know every time I decide to upload or go live. And without further ado, I hope you guys have a wonderful night. Ain't on out. Aces.